Okay, so a couple of weeks ago I posted a tutorial on interleaved practice and maybe you saw it, maybe you didn't see it. Doesn't really matter because I'm not going to be talking about interleaved practice today. Instead, I'm going to be talking about one of the chord progressions that I used as an example in that tutorial because after I posted the tutorial, lots of people came to me and said, hey Bill, can you do a tutorial all about this chord progression? And I was like, okay, fine, that's a good idea. For reasons we'll talk about in just a second. The progression itself is really famous. It's a progression from Johann Pachel Bell's Canon in D, the so-called Pachel Bell's Canon, a really, really incredibly famous piece of music which we'll talk about in a second. But it's um, it's what I'm playing now, by the way, I'm just playing through the chords. It's a really, really useful progression to know for uh, a couple of reasons, really. First of all, because it's used in so many songs, like, you know, it is very, very thoroughly used. Um, you know, I, I named some examples in the previous tutorial, things like um, Memories by Maroon five things like uh, don't look back in anger by oasis if you're a little bit older like me you have a longer memory you might think of songs like um streets of london by ralph mctell lots of different songs like that use this chord progression so it's worth knowing just for that reason but it's also a really useful progression to know because of the number and variety of the chords that it uses. If you know a bit of music theory, you might know what diatonic chords are. It doesn't matter if you don't because we'll come back to them in a second. But it uses, of the seven diatonic chords in any major key, it uses five of the seven. Yeah, and you can tweak it a little bit so that it uses six of the seven. Yeah, we'll talk about how to do that in a minute or two. So this is a progression that is really worth knowing a little bit more about. On a kind of personal note, I also want to talk about it because it seems a nice way of paying tribute to George Winston, who died um, a couple of weeks ago. Um, if you've never heard of George, he was a fantastic um, American piano player. He played blues, he played jazz. His particular thing was playing what he called um, rural folk piano, which kind of has a lot of overlap with the ballad styles and pop piano styles that I often teach on here. And George, a few years ago, released his um, his own kind of realisation of the progression of the, of the canon in D. Um, he, he did it in C major. Lots of the songs I've just talked about, you know, they use the chord progression from canon in D. They don't always do it in D major. But he produced a sort of set of variations on it, which I'll link in the description text down below because they're really worth listening to. So th this is kind of for, for George, who seems to have been from what, you know, I never met him, but I've seen lots of interviews and things. Seems to have been a kind of standout kind of guy as well as a really kind of musical piano player. Okay, Pachel Bell's Canon in D is a piece of classical music written by a guy, well, Baroque music really, written by a guy called Johann Pachel Bell, who lived from 1653 to 1706. A famous musician in his time, a famous organist, um, a friend of the Bach family, but most of the music he wrote has not survived. Okay, One of the pieces that he he wrote that did survive is the canon in D. It was rediscovered sometime in the 19th century and it kind of got kicked around and you know kicked down the corridor like a deflated football for quite a few decades before it was picked up in the 1960s when it was recorded in a kind of messed about with orchestral version. And then what happened is that lots of pop bands around at the time kind of heard the progression, thought this is really cool and used it for their own songs. Great. Um, so yeah, Pachel Bell is the name most associated, or Pachel Bell, however you stress it, is the name most associated with this chord progression. The chord progression predates him. If he had never existed, the progression would still have existed because it's a really obvious chord progression. Okay, It is not one that is kind of magic or secret or anything. And in fact, it's a chord progression that flows kind of really nicely together. Let me just take you through the chords. It's an eight bar progression. Sometimes it's compressed into four bars, but generally speaking, it's an eight bar progression uh, in four four time. The progression itself is not the same as Pachel Bell's Canon, which was a piece of music, a, a canon, which is a particular form of composition, uh, which uses a chord, chord progression, but it's, it's the progression we're interested in. So let's say we're in the key of D major. We can do it in any major key, but we'll stick to D major for now, as P Pachel Bell did. Our first chord is D. We have a measure of D, followed by a measure of A. Then there's a measure of B minor. And then there's a measure or a bar, if you prefer the British terminology of F sharp, minor. Then you've got a bar or a measure <laughs> of G. Then one of D again. And then one of G again. And then the eighth bar, the eighth measure of the progression is A, or A7 as I'm playing there. And that is the dominant chord in the key of G, in the key of D. So that automatically takes you back to the start of the progression, which allows you to loop it. 
let me just improvise through the progression kind of a couple of times. I'll play it really simply first time and a little bit more kind of elaborately the second time, just so you can kind of get a feel of it. And then we'll talk about some of its features and talk about some of the stuff that you can do with it. Here we go. Um, second time through in particular, watch what I'm doing with my left hand. That was first time through, here goes second time. That's the end of the second time, so we'll just resolve it back to a tonic chord. Did you see that that second time through my left hand, the bass line was just going down a scale? Yeah, we'll talk about why that was in a minute or two, because that's one of the interesting things that we can pull out of talking about this progression. Now, it's kind of interesting in harmonic terms, and let's just think about why. Like I said a minute or two ago, it uses five of the diatonic chords of whichever major key you play in. Like I said, it could be in D, could be in C, G, F, whatever, as long as it's a major key. Let's think about what that means. If we're in the key of D major, we have a scale of D major our basic D major scale, D, E, F sharp, G, A, B, C sharp, D. And as you may know, we can grow chords out of that scale, like we would grow like tomatoes out of compost or whatever, yeah? And all, all we do to do that is take a basic chord shape called a triad and start on the first note of the scale, D, with that as the lowest note of the chord, with, with that triad shape, and move that shape up the scale only using the notes of the scale. And that gives us seven chords. One, two, three four, five, six, seven, and then we're back to the number one chord at the top of the scale. Let's name those chords. D, E minor, F sharp minor, G, A, B minor, C sharp diminished, and back to D at the top of the scale. Now here's a really important thing, whichever major key you operate in, you can take any major scale, use that same technique up the major scale of whatever key, and you will always get the same pattern of chords, okay? You will always get major, minor, minor, major, major, minor, diminished, and back to major at the top of the, um, at the top of the scale. So the number one chord, as we call it, will always be major. The number two chord and the number three chord will always be minor. The number four and the five chord will always be major. The number six chord will always be minor. The number seven chord will always be diminished. We often use those numbers as well. We talk about the one, two, three, four, five chords, whatever, of such and such a key because it's an easy way of making comparisons across keys. We can also give them other fancy names. You know, we can talk about the tonic for the number one chord, the dominant for the five chord, the subdominant for the four chord, and then things like the supertonic and the median, the submedium for the other chords. That doesn't really matter, but sometimes you will hear that terminology used. Now, those diatonic chords are important because if you take any song, any piece of music in the key of, in this example, D major, then it will mostly, the heart, you know, the chord progression will mostly consist of those chords. Maybe not exclusively, you might get non-diatonic chords dropped in, but the kind of structure, the kind of, you know, the tent poles that hold the chord progression up will be made up of those chords. And the two most important ones are the number one chord, D, the tonic chord, and the number five chord. Whoops. There's a five chord, A, the dominant chord, because the A chord, the dominant, resolves naturally back to the number one chord. Okay, so using the Pachel Bells canon, or oh, Pachel Bells, one day I'm going to figure out how to stress the guy's name. Some people just say Packabell, but that's not right because there's an L in there, okay? And this is German, so it's very logical, so it's got to be Pachel Bell or Pachel Bell. Uh, if you happen to be German, please uh, do let me know how you would stress that. Because I've got a German speaker in the house, my German isn't bad myself, but I cannot for the life of me work out how to stress that name. Anyway, by the by. So, um... Pachel Bell's Canon in D uses five of those seven chords. You can tweak it a bit, like I said, to use six of the seven, because the one chord that it doesn't use is the number two chord, which would be E minor in the key of D. But you can replace the penultimate chord, the G, that comes before the um, A or A7 chord, if we're operating the key of uh, D major, you can replace that with 
uh, an E minor because the, those two chords in that position have the same function, to use a technical term, they do the same job. And in fact, what, what, what we have there at the end is a two and a five, yeah, resolving to a one. And you might know that's a really um, common resolving chord progression, two, five, one. It's actually even a bit more common than the four, five, one that's in the actual version of um, Pachel Bell's canon that we have there. So, you know, if you want to be, be using six of the seven diatonic chords, you can just, you know, make that little change. Don't worry too much about the fact that it doesn't use the seven chord, the um, uh, the uh, C sharp diminished in the key of D, because that is by far and away the least common of the diatonic chords. Basically, it's half of an A7 chord. Okay, so it does kind of appear, but it's very well. It, it you know it does get used in its own right, but then often it's it's used with an extra seventh on the top to create a diminished seventh chord, which is non-diatonic and blah 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 blah. Don't worry about the seven chord, the diminished chord. Okay, so if you practice um, improvising on this chord progression in a number of different keys, that means you can get yourself really familiar with not only the chords of lots of different major keys, but also how they flow together. Okay, because the other great thing about this progression is that it's a very natural flow. Each chord in the progression is kind of fulfilling its natural function. It's going where it wants to kind of naturally go next, which is why I said that thing about, you know, that this progression would have emerged and probably did emerge before Pachel Bell, even if it wasn't part of this famous piece of music. So what do you do if you're just starting out with this kind of thing? Well, let me play it through a few times and talk about some of the techniques that you can use. First thing I want you to notice, by the way, is that... Um, when I'm playing the right hand shapes in particular, I'm not just playing every chord in the root position. So I've got D, and then I've got A, then I've got B minor, then I've got F sharp, but I'm not doing this. Yeah, because that sounds really sort of jolted and uh, jolted is that a word? It sounds really unnatural anyway, really jumpy. So what I always try to do is kind of interlock the chords. I go from something like D in its root position, in the, thinking about the right hand only, to A there. And that's a perfectly good A chord, it's just that instead of playing the A note, A the note there, I'm playing it up here instead. Then to B minor is root position, and then to F sharp minor there. Again, perfectly good F sharp chord, I'm just, instead of playing the F sharp there, I'm just moving it up there. I could play it in that position if I wanted to. It's still the notes F sharp, A and C sharp, okay? Um, and I'm making use of notes that are close to each other and shared notes as well. So D to A, shared notes. A to B minor. B minor to F sharp, shared note there. Okay, and then, you know, if I go to G, I've got, you know, very close proximity between some of those notes. So I'm, I'm always going for a, a quite a natural um, flow there when I'm choosing my right-hand chord positions. So what I would do especially if you're relatively inexperienced, you just play the progression through quite a few times to familiarise with yourself with it. Play, playing around with those right hand shapes and just playing the root note of each chord, the note that the chord is named after in the bass, like this, okay? simple. Did you notice there that I doubled up the time? Okay, so I was I was actually playing two chords per bar there, which, which is something that you can do. Um, and I was playing the uh, root note of, of each chord in the bass. But you don't have to do that. So maybe the next thing you can do is do what I was doing in the left hand and use what we call a line cliche, because one of the very clever things about Pachel Bell's canon is the way that it fits what we call a line cliche bass line. In the left, I can just go down a D major scale and it will fit with the chords in the right, like this. D, A, but I've got the C sharp of the A chord in the bass, B minor over B, because that's my next note down the scale, to F sharp minor but with its A in the bass, because that note appears in the chord, down to G, down to D but with the F sharp in the bass, and then back up to G, going back up the scale now, and then to A, then back to D. If I wanted to use the, the uh, E minor variation there, I would go from the G to the D over F sharp to the E minor down there and jump up to the A there for the A7 chord. And that's a really nice, cool effect. Line cliche, kind of a negative sounding name, but it, it's a really common thing and, and it works really well. So that's maybe the next thing you could do.
whenever you want to stop, you're going to have to find yourself a D chord elsewhere. The progression will just loop and loop and loop and loop and go over and over and over again. Okay, so let's say you're a little bit more advanced. What can you do to play around with it? Well, there were various things that I was doing a few minutes ago when I was improvising. I was doing things like... Um, Sometimes I was using rhythmic anticipation. I was bringing in the right hand chord ahead of the beat. I think I probably did that. If not, I'll show you. I'll, I'll do it again in a second so you see what that is. Using suspension, this is a very, very George Winston thing. Instead of just playing the straight D chord, doing this, using the suspended ninth. And yes, it is a ninth. Argue with me in the comments. People always argue with me about this. Who cares what it's called? It's the sound it makes. That's really important. So doing that kind of thing, which you can do in lots of, um, lots of the chords. Make sure you're always using scale notes, by the way. Okay, when you're doing that, um, and you can do it from other notes as well, yeah, and you can play around with the bass line, there's all sorts of stuff you can do. What I'm going to do is just improvise through the progression a few times and kind of label it with the stuff that I'm doing. So if you want, you can slow it down a little bit using the YouTube speed function at the bottom, check out the notes that I'm using, and that hopefully will give you some kind of, uh, some kind of hints and tips on how to kind of make this your own. Here we go. Okay, see how you get on with with that. Again, I kind of doubled up the time there, and you can do it however you want. You can either play it one, two, three, four, two, two, three, four, or you can do the two chord per bar thing. It's entirely up to you. Okay, so play around with that. Let me know how you get on. One thing I always really like is when people improvise, uh, you know, through stuff that I've posted here in tutorials, post it online and share the links and let me see how they've got on. That always gives me a real big kick. So if you want to do that, absolutely let me know. If you have any questions, stick them in the comments. If you're not subscribed to my YouTube channel, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, all the usual stuff. Go and get to the piano and have a go at this chord progression. Let me know how you get on. See you soon.